Hey everyone, I think I'm live. Uh, thanks for having me for this maintainer Q&A. My name is Matt Klein, a software engineer at Lyft. I'm still trying to figure out this uh, meeting platform. I don't think I can actually interact with any of you directly, but there's a live Q&A tab on your screen. Um, and if you would like to start asking questions, I can go ahead and uh, answer them for you, or I will also join the Slack room if we want to ask questions that way. So please start firing away and I will monitor the live Q&A. And also, uh, if it isn't already obvious, this is a maintainer Q&A for Envoy Proxy. Looks like we don't have any questions yet. All right, looks like we are starting to get some questions. Fantastic. Um, first question is, can you explain the role of WebAssembly in Envoy? So for those that don't know, um, WebAssembly is uh, an execution framework, um, you know, where you can take programs that are written in multiple different languages, such as Rust and C++ and Go and TypeScript and things like that. And you can compile them down to a common runtime. And, um, and then you can execute them in a safe sandbox. And, you know, it's a really exciting technology in that it allows us to uh, extend things like Envoy in a set of programming languages that people are comfortable with. Whereas historically, the only way to extend Envoy has been with either writing C++ extensions, which has a fairly high learning curve and also obviously has inherent safety issues. Um, and then the other extension option that we've offered has been Lewis scripting. And Lewis scripting has worked out very well, but again, not everyone likes to program in Lua. Um, and, you know, we don't have extension points for all of the different ways that you can currently extend Envoy in C++. So we really view WebAssembly as the future of Envoy extensibility. And, um, you know, we view that for, again, a couple of different reasons. One of them is that we'll allow people to write extensions in different languages that they're comfortable in. So if people want to write in TinyGo, they can do that. If they want to write in Rust, they can do that. If they want to write in safe C++, they can do that. Um, and then over time, uh, I would expect us to allow WebAssembly to offer extensions in all of the places today that C++ can be used to extend Envoy, which is, you you know, again, at this point, probably 10 or 15 or 20 different extension points. So I think it's going to take us two or three years before we get there. But I am really extremely excited for WebAssembly as a technology that will allow people to uh, dynamically extend Envoy. And also when associated with other things that we've been working on um, around dynamic configuration of filters and extensions, um, I, I think there's also really interesting possibilities of allowing WebAssembly code to be dynamically distributed to proxies. So uh, the use case that comes to mind is think of something like a, a web application firewall or WAF filter, where maybe we want to, you know, send rules dynamically down to the proxy, and maybe those rules are written in WebAssembly, and they're compiled in a server um, off host, and then they are dynamically sent down to Envoy. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but I, you know, I, I think it's a very very, very exciting technology that's going to take us uh, a couple of different years uh, sorry a couple of years to actually uh, to actually see the uh, complete fruits of All right. uh, looking let's see um, next question is I'd be interested in an update on UD, UDP support in Envoy uh, so UDP support is, I, I would say it's fairly robust at this point. Um, we offer obviously UDP listeners, um, we offer UDP proxy, um, and within the UDP proxy, we offer various different hashing mechanisms. Um, so I, you know, I, I would definitely encourage people to go through and look at that support. And if it doesn't meet your, uh, what I would call raw UDP use cases, definitely let us know. 
Obviously, UDP itself is also used for quick in HTTP3. Um, so there's an increasing amount of effort going into UDP robustness. And I actually expect us to have um, a public alpha support of quick HTTP3 support in Envoy probably in the next couple of days. So that is quite, quite exciting. Um, but again, I, I think UDP support is ready to go. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look and let us know if there are any issues with the current support. Okay, let's see. Next question. Um, do you think we will see OIDC support directly in Envoy at some point um, for using an external OIDC IDP and configure that directly in Envoy? To be perfectly honest with all of you, um, I am not an authentication and authorization expert. I do know, you know that we have an increasing number of filters that are operating in this space um, around things like OAuth. And then obviously we've had the external authorization filter for quite some time. Um, I, I think the big challenge that we have within Envoy is obviously trying to keep it so, somewhat generic um, and not assume any particular backend server implementation. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think I'm inherently uh, opposed to additional support in this area, but it's definitely not my area of expertise. So I would definitely encourage you to open issues on this and we can discuss further. Um, hold on, I'm trying to see how I can see the questions that haven't been answered. Okay, let's see. Uh, next question. Um, hello, Matt, your deep dive on Envoy internals at um, Coupon EU Copenhagen is still to date my favorite tech talk. Thank you. Um, do such talks help onboarding contributors to Envoy? I think when Envoy was starting out, um, I, I definitely viewed it as very important to, um, you know, uh, help educate people on Envoy internals. And so I, I, I think doing talks and writing blog posts and um, obviously answering questions and talking to folks within the community has been a really, uh, you know, important thing that has allowed Envoy to become what it is today. Sadly, <laughs> I, I don't have as much time as I used to. So uh, between responsibilities for the project and having two young kids, frankly, um, I, I just I just don't personally have as much time. So I would obviously love to be giving more deep dive internal talks. And I would encourage more folks to give those talks or write blog posts or do whatever makes the most sense for them. Um, but I, I just don't have the time right now. So uh, yes, I, I think those types of talks and blog posts really help the project. And um, one of the pitches that I would say to folks is, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive, but I think um, most people, you know, think that it's tough to get people to work on a project like Envoy in terms of the low level code. And the honest reality is that it's actually not that hard to find people to write low level C++ code. Um, what's really hard is to find people who care about documentation and education and examples and all of these kinds of things. So my pitch to all of you is that from a contributor standpoint, um, we really don't actually need more people to write C++ code. We need more people to help with, you know, these types of deep dives and giving talks and writing blog posts and working on documentation. So I would certainly encourage anyone listening who is interested in contributing in those ways to reach out to us or myself. Let's see, next question. Um, could you give a quick status update on Windows support? Uh, I am not in the day to day of Windows and I actually tried to have one of the maintainers of Windows join this chat, but un unfortunately the platform was locked and we could not add him. But I believe we are uh, um, very close to offering a Windows GA. Um, and, you know, that won't be 100% feature parity with Linux, but it, it, it will be close and it should be usable for Windows production workloads. And I know that there's various organizations that are um, wanting to use it in, in prod. So I think we're pretty close and I would definitely um, look for a blog post coming out in the next couple of weeks that will announce that. Uh, and then you can give it a shot. 
let me just make sure that I've gone through all of the questions that we have so far. I'm just gonna delete the ones that I've answered. Please fire away. Okay, okay, I have another question. With the rise of Rust usage in low-level stacks and the improvements to the networking libraries, do you ever think Envoy will have some Rust in it? Um, I think absolutely yes. I um, I think we're already starting to see Rust uh, within WebAssembly. So I, I think my impression is that Rust is the most common language that people are using to write WebAssembly extensions. So I think that's where we are going to see it start. Um, and like all of the recent announcements of bringing Rust to the Linux kernel, um, you know, of bringing Rust to other projects uh, such as such as Chromium, I fully expect that we will, um, you know, that we will see Rust within Envoy. Um, you know, I, I think it's a very exciting path that that language has taken, and you know, I, I'm no, um, I'm no huge supporter of C++ myself. So if there's a better alternative, I think that would be great. But like all of these other projects, we have hundreds of thousands of uh, complicated lines of code, and it's not reasonably possible to rewrite everything. So I think we're going to be taking a pragmatic approach. And I think the bigger complexity for Envoy um, versus something like Linux is Rust and C interop is a bit easier than Rust and C++ interop. And I, I don't have a link handy, but I, I think that the folks over at Chromium have um, you know done some research and there's some really great projects within the Rust community on C++ and Rust interop. And I would expect that that's an area that's only going to get better over the next few years because there's obviously hundreds of millions, billions, I don't know, maybe even a trillion lines of C++ code out there. So uh, we're not going to rewrite it all at once. Um, we're going to have to take a pragmatic approach. And yes, I would, I would definitely expect to see Rust within Envoy. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Happy to also take questions in the main to KubeCon maintainer Slack room, if that's easier.
Okay, let's see. Next question. Um, what is the biggest thing you would want to improve in Envoy right now if you had all the time you wanted? Well, that's a tough one. Um, I, I, I think for me, um, it, it would probably still be around documentation um, and onboarding. You know, I, I, I think we still do a great job. Um, uh, you know, around the code and the features, the feature velocity continues to be huge. Um, you know, there's always small improvements that we can do in code quality or, uh, you know, in testing coverage or in performance or all of those things. But, um, you know, we have so many extremely talented contributors that work on that stuff that it's not a huge concern of mine. Um, but I, you know, I, I think in terms of things that we can improve, it really is that onboarding experience. And what I do mention to people, uh, which I find very interesting, is that I'm very frequently told with Envoy, you know, two different things. I, I'm told on one hand that the project has amazing documentation and it's fantastic. Um, and then I'm told at the same time that, you know, the project has the worst documentation ever and I don't understand how anyone can possibly use this thing. And, you know, the, the take the takeaway from that for me is that it's obviously we have um, a lot of different types of consumers and it's very difficult to have a one uh, a one size fits all approach to project documentation. But one of the things that I think that we can do really well is to improve that onboarding experience. And we have made a lot of strides here recently with improving documentation linkages, um, you know, making uh, things less manual, making sure that for extensions, we can click through to the documentation for them and have examples. Um, we have a lot more sandbox, sandbox examples now. But there's other things that I think that we can do, for example, have a, you know, VS Code Envoy configuration um, plugin so that where it has type ahead and it has built in documentation and things like that. Um, so that's probably the one thing I, I, I think it's the onboarding and um, I, I, I think that's where we can bridge the gap to people that might be intimidated by all of Envoy's functionality because for better or worse, Envoy is a very complicated piece of software that has lots of different features and it can be very intimidating for new users. So I think just really investing in that documentation writing examples and that entire ecosystem, um, I, I think that's the thing that I would like to improve if there is unlimited time. So let's see. Uh, next question is, um, which benefits um, other than performance does XDS provide? Um, so for those that don't know, XDS is the name of our generic configuration API. Um, and, you know, we started a long time ago with just a few different XDS APIs, uh, things like EDS or Endpoint Discovery Service, CDS, Cluster Discovery Service, LDS, Listener Discovery Service. And over time, you know, we have developed, I don't even know now, probably between, you know, 10 or so, um, 10 or so different APIs. And the main thing that XDS provides, and I actually think that XDS has been the main contribution of Envoy versus the code, is um, it, it, it has given us a well-defined uh, base where we care about backwards compatibility. Um, you know, we take it super seriously in terms of the API design. Um, and now, you know, XDS in its current form has actually expanded beyond Envoy. Um, we now see that gRPC uses XDS. Um, I think there's internal systems and tools at various companies that speak XDS. So, uh, you know, we've effectively developed a network configuration API, um, you know, for, for these types of systems. So I think the real benefit, you know, is not really one of performance. I think the real benefit of XDS is it's giving us a common language that we can use, um, you know, that will allow us to actually configure these types of systems across the industry. And that has spawned a huge vertical ecosystem of products and services based on Envoy and eventually gRPC and other systems. So, um, I think that's that's the main benefit of XDS. All right, let me just go through. There's some more questions now. Let me clean these out.
Okay, next question. Um, based on your experience in growing and building a community around Envoy, what advice would you give uh, to newly founded OSS projects um, besides the onboarding experience? I've given several talks on this and it's something that I think about a lot. And I don't think there's I don't think there's one one answer here. Um, I do think that the onboarding experience is very important, as has been noted. So, um, you know, things like a slick UI and making sure that there's examples ready to go, and things like Docker and Docker Compose, um, you know, and making sure that people can can get started with the project as well as with the contribution guidelines. Um, but you know the the main piece of advice that I give people you know around starting an open source project is that it's a huge time commitment to do well. Um, building community is hard work, and it really requires a lot of effort and a lot of patience and a lot of time. And the biggest piece of advice that I actually give people, which um, sounds uh, really, really simple and probably obvious is just to be really nice. You know, when you when, when you start a new project, uh, you don't you don't have a community. You don't have anyone to actually help. And encouraging new contributors and new maintainers and new people to join up is is the most important thing. So being very welcoming to everyone that comes. Um, you know, making sure that communication is just welcoming and nice and um, you know, taking the time to answer people's questions and get them onboarded and facilitate helping them with the code and all of those things. Um, I, I think, you know, that that is probably the most important thing. I think there's smaller items like trying to have good issues for new contributors and again, good documentation and all of the ancillary non code things that, um, you know, people tend to think about after the code, but in my opinion, in my experience, they tend to be more important than the code itself. So I would, uh, I would definitely, <laughs> definitely encourage focusing on those things. And I don't have the link handy right now, but I gave a talk at OSCon uh, a couple of years ago. I think the title, it's on YouTube, and I think the title is, you know, something around the, the, you know, amazing success of Envoy. Um, so I would definitely search for that talk, and I gave an entire talk on this topic. Let's see. Uh, next question. Do you think some part of the Envoy magic could be rewritten using eBPF? Would it make sense on the performance side? Um, I, I'm also not an eBPF expert. I I definitely believe that there are probably uh, large parts of Envoy that could be written using using eBPF. Um, it's theoretically possible that all of Envoy could be written using eBPF. You know whether that's practical or not. I don't know, um, but I I do think that over time we will definitely see more functionality move into the kernel just from a just from a performance standpoint. We already see uh, projects such as Cilium um, that rely both on eBPF as well as Envoy, where they have a split of doing uh, you know a bunch of functionality in the kernel in terms of things like TLS offload and more um, efficient routing of packets you know between processes. Um, and then they also route up to Envoy to do various policy aspects. So, you know, they would certainly be the best people to ask in terms of why they've chosen to split things where they have and whether over time they expect more functionality to move within eBPF. I would imagine the, the biggest issue on the eBPF side is that and again, I'm not an expert here, is I think there are restrictions on the type of code that can run within eBPF. Um, for example, my understanding is that I don't, I don't think you can have things like loops and various other things, you know, so I, I think it would be difficult to rewrite all of Envoy as an eBPF program. But, you know, between some combination of eBPF and kernel offload and, you know, running in, you know, user space uh, projects like Envoy, I, I have no doubt that things will shift around um, over time. Okay, let's see, next. Uh, 
question. Since documentation is the main improvement part, what's the main thing in Envoy lacking documentation for now, in your opinion, besides generic newcomer stuff? I think the main thing that we're lacking right now in Envoy around documentation actually comes back to extensions. I think, <clears throat> so for those that don't know, Envoy uses Protobuf as our configuration language. And I'm a, a huge proponent of Protobuf. I think it's an amazing project. And I think in Proto3, they've done a really incredible job of allowing conversion between YAML and JSON and Proto. Um, so it really gives you the best of both worlds. It allows people to configure things in YAML, but still have um, you know, the, the, the real inherent structure of the Protobuf IDL. Um, and without getting into the weeds, the way that we handle um, extension, extension configuration with Envoy from a configuration perspective is a little convoluted and can, it can be very difficult to learn for, it can be difficult to learn for new users. And the way that uh, extension works is that we basically use type URLs within Protobuf. So there's a, a Protobuf type called an any, and it allows you to specify a generic type and then have configuration within that. And it's done for a very good reason, which is that Envoy allows extensions to be compiled into the binary that Envoy doesn't know about ahead of time. So we need this generic mechanism where we can offer extensions that Envoy core doesn't know about, and then users can actually configure them. So, you know, we use this protobuf any and type URL configuration mechanism. The problem with that is that for new users, it can be very difficult for them to understand what is what are the extensions that are available? What is the magic type URL that I have to use? What is the configuration that can come under that type URL? And once you're, uh, you know, an experienced uh, user, I think that it's not a big deal, but for new users, it can be very daunting. And um, so that's what I was talking about before, where we're starting to put in a lot of effort into cross-linking between various aspects of the documentation so that it's automated. So you go to an extension point and you can you know, click through all of the different extensions that are available. We wanna provide example snippets for every extension so that the user can just see what they have to put into their config. Um, again, I'd like to do a VS Code plugin where you know it actually has auto completion. So I think there's some things that we can do there that will really help the 99% use case. Um, so I, I think that's the main thing, and I think the work is ongoing. But if you're passionate about it, uh, definitely please please reach out and help us. All right. Next question. Any plans for XDS v4? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> um, the XDS v2 to v3 transition was a very large learning experience for the project. And I'm going to be honest, I, I think knowing what we know now, we would not have done it. And I think that um, we are. We are retaining the uh, the opportunity to do a V4, but there are no plans to do it. And realistically, I think we are many years to never uh, out from it. And instead of doing a V4, we are working now on a minor version proposal, which will try to actually have uh, it'll be a compromise between doing a clean new version where we can actually delete fields um, and allowing us to have clients that will remove deprecated functionality that may have been deprecated for several years. So yeah, um, I would definitely watch this space. I, I think it's something that we will continue to improve and learn about. Um, but at this point, I, I think the, the amount of effort around the industry that went into v3 um, was not worth the benefit and, and part of that is, is actually just hindsight on on time and growth of the project we started talking about v3 at this point it was probably a year and a half ago and just with the meteoric rise of the project we didn't have as many users as we have now um, so you know I, I think when we started talking about it we really underestimated the uh, you know the burden that it would cause people we didn't understand it uh, and I think we have a better understanding now 
coupled with just the large usage. So I think, um, you know, I, I, th I think we've learned a lot. I think we're going to continue to improve in this area. And um, I would expect us to do better in the future. And no, I don't expect to see a V4 anytime soon. Well, it looks like we have time for one or two more questions. So please go ahead and type them in. All right, let's see. Since this is a maintainer Q&A, could you share with us how things went regarding your work as an Envoy maintainer and as an engineer at Lyft at the same time, even if both are linked? Like what balance did you find between work on Envoy that was related to Lyft needs and work on Envoy that was unrelated? Was there any real discussion about this or did things just happen naturally? This is a complicated topic. Um, and I've, I've done a few podcasts on this and I would definitely encourage folks to, um, you know, to listen to some of the podcasts that I've done in this area. But very quickly, I would say it's complicated. I, I think as an industry, we don't do a very good job of being honest with um, people about the needs of open source in terms of just what it means to do the things that I was talking about before, about answering questions and helping people and fixing bugs and doing things that may not be directly related to the employer of the person who's doing that. And, um, you know, I will be honest in saying that in 2017, um, you know, that was a very rough period of time for me in which Lyft was supportive for sure, but still I, I, I was doing two jobs then. I was, you know, basically working full time on, um, you know, really creating the community and recruiting maintainers and contributors and all of the wonderful people that we see today. And that was a full time job. And at that time, I was still, you know, working full time at Lyft, basically operating Envoy and running the networking team. And 2017 was a very tough year because I, I there just weren't enough hours in the day. And I had to choose between Envoy and choose between Lyft. And, you know, there were some conflicts there. And obviously things could have gone better in certain cases, but, you know, that's just life. And, um, you know, now, obviously, with the success of the project, um, things are much improved. I, you know, I, I have um, a bit more leeway to, you know, spend the time on open source and to make sure that I have a decent work-life balance. Um, but I'm going to be completely honest that it's a it's a really difficult problem and there's no easy answer here and what i would say just wrapping up is, is that i really encourage a very uh, open and honest communication around open source between um, employer and employee and be really honest about motivations and time and i really encourage people just to have that constant conversation to hopefully avoid getting into that two job to job situation. And I also encourage people like the poster mentioned in their question to try to find common ground of working on open source, um, you know, for things that the company actually cares about. And I think that's, that's the way that it tends, tends to go the best. Um, so I will stop there. I will be in Slack if, if people want to continue this conversation. Um, and anyway, thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you for coming to this maintainer Q and A.